Take Me for a Ride, Coming of Age in a Destructive Cult, by Mark Laxer, reading by Mark Laxer. Chapter 7, Money Mantra. Arriving Carlos in California, Atmananda thought about continuing his career as a college professor. He thought about writing another book. He even considered going to law school. Instead, he expanded the Money Club. The Money Club had started in New York when Atmananda began collecting from Stony Brook disciples. We voluntarily gave a few dollars a month to offset the cost of the posters. In San Diego, he raised membership dues to four or so dollars a week. Rachel, who took out loans to help the San Diego Chinmoy Center get started, gave much more. As the center rapidly grew, so did the numbers in Atmananda's club. Seekers used to live in monasteries and in caves, Atmananda taught at center meetings, but Guru recommends that instead we live in a city. This gives us the opportunity to strengthen our psychic defenses and to better serve humanity. In order to live in the world, particularly as your consciousness evolves and as the vibrations of the world grow darker, you will need money. Most of the new disciples, though, were UCSD undergraduates. When Amananda explained the etiquette of selfless giving, you can give in the right way or you can give in the wrong way. Many of us wondered how we could give in any way. Most of the new disciples, though, were UCSD undergraduates. When Atmananda explained the etiquette of selfless giving, you can give in the right way, or you can give in the wrong way. Many of us wondered how we could give in any way. But Atmananda had an idea. He suggested that we take out student loans for more than we actually need. You can then donate the extra amount to a worthy cause, he pointed out, to a genuine spiritual center, for instance. It was no coincidence that the center's finances improved significantly after banks issued checks for guaranteed student loans. Atmananda had another idea. Accepting money from your parents is the spiritual thing to do. Why not give your parents the opportunity to help? Why shouldn't they be given the opportunity to make spiritual progress? He even devised a way that we could earn money. Why work for five dollars an hour when you could be making twenty? Work is not supposed to be fun. Believe me, they would not be paying you if it was. Unless you already have a career that you're happy with, you should study computer science. Most of you developed software back in Atlantis, back when computers were far more advanced than they are today. Keeping track of all those variables will help you strengthen your mind. Besides, programming pays extremely well after a relatively short period of time. Amananda interspersed talk of raising consciousness and money with stories from the rich world of his imagination. He told stories, for instance, about a legendary character that he called the Gwid. The Gwid is close friends with Roshi Megabox, he said, stroking his chin and smiling. The Gwid leases all of reality to God. At one center meeting, a UCSD anthropology graduate student pointed out that millions in the world were starving. Shouldn't we be doing something to help? she asked. On the surface, Atmananda replied, Elizabeth is asking a perfectly legitimate question. But if you could see, you would have detected the underlying hostility in her tone. The room filled with uneasy silence. But that is why we study meditation, he went on. We are constantly striving to perfect our different selves. He slowly scanned the disciples. 
Many of you send guru hostile vibrations in the inner worlds. So don't hide beyond the holier-than-thou facade. It isn't necessary. We understand. He turned back to Elizabeth, his sarcastic power transforming into a compassionate smile. There are many who are suited for helping the poor. What we do here is help people on a higher level. He went on to provide a framework through which to view poverty. Each soul, he explained, chooses the circumstance of its birth so that it can best work out its karma. At first, Elizabeth's question struck a chord in me, but I associated her question with Atmananda's accusation that many of us were sending hostile vibes to Guru. This made me upset, so I tried to think about something else. But there was something else I was trying not to think about. Has anyone noticed that I have been going into advanced states of consciousness? Abhinanda had started to ask at the center meetings. At first, there had been no response. The powers from my past lives are returning, he continued. My consciousness is cycling. Those of you who can see will easily feel the change. Several disciples nodded as though, for the first time, they were feeling the change. I knew that if I gazed at him intensely for several minutes, I saw auras in whichever hue I imagined. Nonetheless, I had not detected the change. I had wanted to maintain complete trust in my mentor, housemate, and friend. I told myself that my seeing abilities must not be too advanced. Atmananda then changed the subject. The golden guid card, he said with a grin, gives the guid in Roshi Megabox unlimited access to multidimensional trans-reality banking networks. Perhaps it was with the golden guid card in mind that Atmananda asked me to perform a, quote, task of power. He instructed me to inspire each of the several dozen disciples in the center to donate money. Tell them that the money will be used to buy me a surprise gift, and tell them that the gift will be a new car. He suggested that I remind them that he worked night and day for the good of others, that he was broke because he gave all his money to the center, and that if he concentrated on making money rather than on helping Guru's mission, he could easily afford to buy his own car. Got it, I said. Don't pressure anyone. If someone does not want to contribute, that's fine. Of course. And keep a list of who gave what. No problemo. Honored that Atmananda would trust me with such responsibility, with such a secret, and with so much money, I felt guilty for not having thought of the idea myself. I understood that Atmananda was being a sneak, but he did work for the good of others night and day, and ours was the fastest-growing Chinmoy Center in the world, and the Guru's mission would suffer if Atmananda worked a traditional job. Besides, I was drawn to the idea of sneaking for a noble cause. The disciples gave generously, and Atmananda soon shifted the garage door opener from Rachel's car, which he had frequently borrowed, to the glove compartment of his shiny new Renault Le Car. Rachel, who had donated generously to the surprise gift, felt that they should share the garage door opener. She decided that Atmananda was being unfair and told him so. The next day, Atmananda instructed Dana to tell Rachel that, spiritually seeking, she was heading for some serious hot water and better apologize quickly. Unaware of the garage door opener incident, I was feeling pretty good. I felt even better when Atmananda, who liked the new car, reminded the center of how advanced a soul I really was. When the disciples began to treat me with a mellow kind of reverence, a local phenomenon perhaps to Southern California, 
I was thrilled. I had an intuitive grasp on how to wield the ad hoc power, but I did not grasp that it was the power which was actually wielding me. Meanwhile, Atmananda had added money collector to the growing list of my responsibilities. This task, he cautioned, was not without its dangers. Money is physically dirty, he said, as though telling me a secret. It also retains and transmits the greed of its handlers. Always wash your hands after you touch it. But he did not always ask me to collect it directly. In 1981, he asked me to inspire Richard, a large-hearted disciple who owned a racket-stringing shop in La Jolla. Richard, who appeared to love Guru even more than he loved tennis, was on the verge of purchasing a million-dollar house, which he planned to rent to the center at a bargain rate. How's your game coming along? I asked him. Oh, not too bad, I suppose. Are you ready to play against Guru? Guru's not going to want to play tennis with me. Sure he is. Only if I were you, I'd let him win every so often. We laughed. How's the deal going? I asked. His gaiety suddenly vanished. It almost went through, he said. But someone pulled out at the last minute again. Oh, well, I tried. Maybe there's someone else who could help. No response. Wouldn't it be great, I continued, to have the center across the street from UCSD? Parking sure wouldn't be a problem anymore. And picture a meditation room overlooking the ocean. A meditation room, large enough to hold everyone. He nodded. Imagine Guru coming to San Diego and visiting us at the new center. That would be nice, he admitted. Remember, Richard, I added, working in a quote from Atmananda, whatever you really want, you will get. You're right, he said resolutely. I'll just keep trying. After several more setbacks, the deal went through, and Atmananda, Dana, Ann, Tammy, and I moved in. Atmananda occasionally paced the carpets of the new center, improvising a song from Fiddler on the Roof, in which pious dairyman Tevye aspires for a little wealth from God. If I was a realized soul, Atmananda began, yada dada yada dada yada dada yada all day long I'd bitty bitty bomb. If I was a realized soul, ah, I wouldn't have to work hard. Once at the new center, Atmananda recited for me the money mantra. Yandevi sarva bhute saratna rupena sangsita nastavai nas namastvai namasvai namo nama, he chanted soulfully. If I could have followed his words down the corridors of time, I would have seen him. Yadevi, dramatically increasing the cost of public meditation lectures and seminars. Sarvabhutesa, charging a thousand dollars a person for weekend desert trips, 1987. Radna Rupena, increasing his advertising budget from hundreds, 1977, to hundreds of thousands, 1987. Sangthita requesting that mandatory tuition, which took the place of the voluntary money club, be paid in hundred-dollar denominations to avoid, quote, low-vibe tens and twenties, suggesting that followers hold off on tax payments until, quote, later, raising monthly tuition from a hundred dollars, 1982, to approximately thirty-five hundred dollars, 1993. Nastavai, driving a Renault Le Car in 1979, a BMW 1981, a 911 Porsche 1982, a 928 Porsche 
a Bentley, 1991, keeping seven cars at his New York property, three Mercedes-Benzes, two Porsches, and two Range Rovers, 1991. Namasvai, namasvai. Renting the Del Mar Castle, complete with turrets, a walk-in fireplace, and full-court basketball game-sized living room, 1982. Renting in Malibu what he claimed was Goldie Hawn's house, 1983. Spending roughly $900 per night for a hotel suite where his dog enjoyed a room of its own, 1988. Buying a house in Conscience Bay in Old Field, New York for about $950,000, 1988. Buying a house in Tessuc, a suburb near Santa Fe, New Mexico for about $875,000, 1990. Spending approximately $1 million on each house for electronic security systems and renovations, 1991. Renting Sting's house in Malibu Colony for about $25,000 a month, 1992. Namo Nama! I spent many happy hours with Atmananda in the plushly carpeted meditation room, watching the Pacific Ocean as I listened to him sing and talk about his dreams. Deeply believing that millions would be made happy, I refused to acknowledge that millions would soon be made. And though I never chanted the money mantra, I helped my housemate, who did. <laughs>